John Williams and Ennio Morricone are two of the most iconic composers in the history of cinema. For the mission, Ennio Morricone. John Williams for Jaws. Ennio Morricone for Bugsy. For Empire of the Sun, John Williams. And yet, as prolific as they both were, they were rarely working on similar things at the same time. Although there is one odd case where they did. If you listen to the opening themes of both movies without any further context, you could not be blamed for thinking that these would be similar movies. Which is not entirely wrong. In more ways than one, these two movies seem fated to mirror each other. One was an instant success that lost its relevance over the years, and the other was an initial flop that today is considered a cult classic. How and why did this happen? E.T. The Extraterrestrial, already one of the most successful movies of all time. You know, I never thought of E.T. as a science fiction. I saw this as a story about a family. The thing was on. People hated that movie. Critics hated it too. What does that term cult film mean to you? And do you like it? Do you think it as a company? Now it's a masterpiece, universally heralded. I think it's one of the greatest horror movies ever made, if not one of the greatest movies. In 1977, Star Wars broke new ground when it became the highest grossing movie of all time. Its dominance was so absolute that it spurred a sort of gold rush for science fiction movies, as all studios tried to find the same success that 20th Century Fox had seemingly stumbled upon, while also making their peace with the fact that George Lucas would probably hold on to his record for many years. Well, not only did he lose it, but it took a mere five years for it to be snatched away. And this by none other than his friend and fellow director, Steven Spielberg. I had no expectations with E.T. I, I just didn't. Nowadays, Spielberg's filmography speaks for itself. But even back in 1982, the director already commanded respect, with films like Jaws and Raiders of the Lost Ark under his belt. To boot, Spielberg was no stranger to science fiction, in fact, the same year that Star Wars had come out, he had released Close Encounters of the Third Kind, to great success. It made perfect sense for Universal Studios to pick him to be their vanguard in science fiction. They had only one concern. Spielberg was directing a family-oriented movie. I still felt that I had made a Disney film and I was also pretty convinced that the box of his fate of E.T. would be the same as the box of his fate of many Disney films that had come out in the 70s and the very early 80s. And the competition for the summer of 1982 was unlike any that had come before it when it came to science fiction and fantasy. But soon to compete are some very dazzling science fiction films. Today we sneak preview a few. Among the movies that were going to be shown in theaters that summer were Conan the Barbarian, Poltergeist, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Tron, and Mad Max 2. Not to mention more mainstream movies with mass appeal like Rocky III. Universal executives feared that Spielberg's movie would alienate childless adult audiences, and so the studio opted for a two-pronged approach. They came up with a sort of plan B. In order to dominate the box office, they would release another movie that summer, R-rated and intended exclusively for adult audiences. Eventually, the summer of 1982 arrived. And it wasn't even close. Rocky III, the third installment in an already extremely popular franchise, achieved a box office of $110 million which, while impressive, was still less than half of the $240 million that E.T. the Extraterrestrial had made. I had only seen the movie once as a boy, and so I rewatched it recently for the purpose of making this video. To be completely transparent, I went into this movie thinking that it was overrated, and I was ready to find that the magic that I had felt as a child was lost. I couldn't have been more wrong.
Children's movies can alienate adult audiences when it becomes clear that they were not made with them in mind. If all you see is glitter and sparkles, parents will easily dismiss what their children adore. But watching it again as an adult recontextualized the movie for me, and it became clear why it had been so popular back then. E.T. shows enlightened decision-making by embracing the dichotomy between children and adults. The story is told in such a way that the parents in the theaters were watching a different movie than the one their children were watching. And yet, there is a common core grounded in the pure and unprejudiced friendship between a boy and an extraterrestrial being that unites the entire audience in hopeful wonder and bittersweet happiness. That, to me, is the sign of an excellent movie that is not only intended, but carefully crafted for all audiences. Universal's concerns proved unfounded, and Americans of all ages flooded the theaters to watch their movie. Remember how far I, I think it was around the block? I think it was, it was, wasn't it? Yet, in the wake of this overwhelming success, Universal seemingly forgot about the other movie they had released that summer. And why shouldn't they have? It had performed poorly, the critics had panned it, and Americans seemed to despise it. Not to fret, it had simply been a plan B that did not work out. What mattered was that Spielberg had won against Lucas, and Universal had won against 20th Century Fox. What most missed back then was that, lost amidst the many science fiction movies overtaken by E.T. during that summer of 1982, were two movies that I hold very near and dear to my heart. One was a little movie called Blade Runner which you might have heard of if you like sci-fi. And the other was Universal's failed Plan B, a sci-fi horror movie called The Thing. When I say sci-fi horror, what comes to your mind? There are plenty of examples of it now, but back in 1982, there was only one real contender for that description, Alien. The movie came out two years after Star Wars. Now, you would imagine that anyone trying to cash in on the sci-fi craze of the time would try to emulate Star Wars. But director Ridley Scott showed everyone that this was not the case. Despite being a tense and horrifying story about a spaceship crew being stalked by a deadly alien life form, his movie became a box office success. Studio executives could clearly see that the people wanted sci-fi regardless of what form it took. This in turn meant that directors were given more freedom to experiment and to try to get creative within the genre. It was probably in this spirit that Universal hired John Carpenter to direct their Plan B. While he had directed sci-fi movies before, Carpenter's main claim to fame was Halloween, a B-movie slasher that has since become a classic of the horror movie genre. It is more than likely that Universal once again wanted to contend with 20th Century Fox and produce a sci-fi horror movie of their own. And assuming the movie ended up being something like Halloween, it would be the perfect type of movie to complement the release of E.T. Universal wanted and expected nothing more than a gruesome and scary B-movie. However, in doing so, it seems they misunderstood both the assignment they had given and who they had given it to because Carpenter was not the kind of director to play it safe. For a bit of history, The Thing is a remake, of sorts. It was the second movie inspired by a science fiction novella entitled Who Goes There, written by John W. Campbell, and unlike the first 1952 movie, which was titled The Thing from Another World, it aimed to be a faithful adaptation of the original novella. After spending about a decade in production hell, the project finally landed on Carpenter's lap, who took on the movie hesitantly, as he greatly appreciated the original movie as well as Campbell's novella, and did not want to besmirch their legacy. Technically speaking, the movie was a great success. Had Campbell lived to see it, I am certain that he would at least have been somewhat satisfied, because his short story was truly brought to life. 
Over the course of two tense and grueling hours, we see the crew of an Antarctic research station discover that, one by one, they are being replaced by alien life forms that devour their prey before transforming into copies with no identifiable differences. I don't know what you're saying. There was one of those things out there trying to imitate him, Gary. The looming dread, paranoia, and hysteria of the characters is complemented by the truly horrific shapes that the lifeform takes while it is mid-transformation, to make for a genuinely disturbing experience. If I was an imitation, a perfect imitation, how would you know if it was really me? If you were all these things, then you'd just attack me right now. So some of you are still human. The thing is awesome, and it should have worked. The reasons why the movie did not perform at the box office are well documented, and Carpenter himself has spoken on this subject many times. There were countless factors that played into it, such as the oversaturated market of science fiction movies of the time, the rated R restriction limiting audience sizes, and the lackluster advertising from Universal preceding the movie. But this only accounts for some of its failure. After all, Blade Runner had its debut during the same weekend, and despite receiving mixed reviews, many were quick to praise it and recognize Ridley Scott's genius. People could understand that even if it wasn't everybody's cup of tea, it could become a very popular movie in time. The thing was given no such grace. Putting it simply, the movie was too much, in every sense. People hated that movie. The fans hated that movie. Critics hated it too. At the time, The Thing paired some of the most gruesome and horribly creative practical effects ever put to film with an unsettling and nihilistic narrative centered on the idea of paranoia and mutually assured destruction. With this kind of movie releasing in the middle of a recession during the tense times of the Cold War, it turned out that Americans were not too keen on the experience that Carpenter had envisioned for them. And once the public abandoned it, critics were more than happy to lambast the movie. Ultimately, it seems the thing was caught in a perfect storm, and that there was very little that could be done to salvage the movie's performance in theaters. After that dismal performance, it seemed fated to fall into obscurity. In truth, the ice had merely begun to thaw. About a decade later, with the Cold War over and the recession in the past, Americans found themselves slowly rediscovering the movie at their home theaters. It seemed that, when considered separately from its 1982 rivals, the thing proved to be a timeless movie that had aged like wine. Like Blade Runner, it overcame its initial struggles to become a cult classic, with the bonus of being popular with both horror and science fiction fans. What's more, its influence can be felt across many mediums, and none more than games. There is a whole genre of board games such as Werewolf, The Resistance, and Secret Hitler, which fundamentally rely on the asymmetrical information that players have regarding one another. This is not to speak of the many video games that function similarly, where players have to root out the imposters among them while the traders try to eliminate their peers one by one, all of this without being detected. In fact, the first time that I encountered the thing was in a StarCraft II mod map with the same name, where players did exactly the same thing that happens in the movie. Suspect each other, throw baseless accusations, and kill everybody. I think it all goes to show that, as a concept, the balancing game between paranoia and self-preservation that is put forward by the thing carries over very well into other formats. But what about E.T.? Well, the movie was nominated to several Oscars and was the favorite to win Best Picture in 1983. 20 years later, it was still as beloved, getting remastered in 2002. Even now, it is still considered one of the greatest films of all time, and if you ask anyone who saw it in theaters back then, they will probably agree. And yet, while it might have beaten both Star Wars and Star Trek II in the box office, E.T. does not measure up to either of these movies when it comes to its footprint in the world of science fiction, or even beyond. One could think that its influence lives on in characters that fulfill a similar narrative role to that of E.T. in similar stories. 
However, these characters are not necessarily inspiring themselves from E.T. specifically, as the human befriends extraordinary being trope was done before E.T. and will probably continue to be popular for many years to come. It seems that the extraterrestrial's influence is felt more in the aesthetic and directorial choices rather than in the character's behavior. Oddly enough, some of the most influential parts of the movie are the parts that do not include the extraterrestrial. The boys playing Dungeons and Dragons at the start, the bike riding scenes, and the general suburban vibe of the movie were clearly an inspiration to a whole range of other media that did not involve aliens, but rather teenagers going on adventures. Ultimately, certain references and catchphrases of the movie may still carry some weight with the demographic that saw it back then, but beyond that, its cultural relevance seems to have decreased with the passing of time. So why is it that the once highest grossing movie of all time has faded from the cultural consciousness, while the runt of the litter has only become increasingly relevant? My father once told me about the scariest movie that he had ever seen. He was living away from home, and in the middle of winter, he went to a movie theater with a friend. He told me that the scariest thing about it was not the movie itself. Rather, it was that once the movie ended and they stepped outside, he realized that they would have to walk back to their dormitory in the dark of night. Through the snow. If this isn't the telltale sign that you have made a good horror movie, I don't know what is. Horror is meant to stay with you, to hang over your shoulder on that walk back home. Which is why, in theory, the more realistic horror is, the more it should unnerve you. But beyond the fear of something terrible happening to you and those you love, horror is also about the fear of questions and answers. Questions that you don't want to ask, and answers that you don't want to know. The same is true for science fiction. Although its questions are usually philosophical, they very often verge on existential thoughts that can be quite terrifying, making it easy to push the narrative towards dark and ominous places. Conversely, in its pursuit of images, sounds and concepts that will disturb the spectator while maintaining an element of realism, horror often finds itself on the doorstep of science fiction, and is more than happy to cross that threshold in order to deepen its narrative. I believe that is why Campbell opted for the title of his novella to be a question. With the release of Alien, it became clear that Ridley Scott was not merely trying to satisfy his producers and deliver a superficial sci-fi blockbuster. The director wanted to push the boundaries of the genre to try and tell more compelling stories, incorporating the themes of science fiction into the thrilling experience of a horror movie. In that same spirit, Carpenter decided to challenge the genre by pushing the horror of sci-fi as far as he could. The Thing was not the first mimic monster in cinema. Invasion of the Body Snatchers did it before. But The Thing embodies the essence of both science fiction and horror short stories, in that it is less interested in telling us a story and more interested in asking us questions. King among these questions is... What is The Thing? Or rather, who is the thing? As opposed to that, E.T. is a movie that only seems to be asking a question. What would happen if a boy and an alien became friends? If we're being perfectly honest, the movie is not really trying to answer that question. Elliot and E.T. become friends almost instantly. The language barrier is quickly overcome, and Elliot's siblings are quick to become allies. There are very few obstacles in the story, and they are conveniently disposed of as soon as the emotional heart of this narrative demands that the exit stage left. So, since this movie is not asking any questions of us, that means that it is content with telling us a story. Its message is that the innocence of children is a quality that adults quickly lose and that this quality is necessary for accepting those different from us. To drive this point home, Spielberg does subvert the trope of the evil government trying to capture the alien in order to perform experiments on him, by making the government agents be doctors, hoping to save E.T., and finally revealing the faces that he's been hiding from us the entire movie. 
children engrossed in the main narrative will miss it, but parents will know that this is a message to them. You do not need to leave your innocence behind and become a faceless antagonist. You can choose to believe like children do. This, while very touching, is not the kind of message that requires sci-fi in order to be transmitted. In a way, the main goal of E.T. is not to make you deliberate, but to make you feel. And it is very successful at eliciting emotion. The problem with movies like those is that, once you're done feeling, there's not much to discuss. On the contrary, at the end of the movie, the thing will leave you feeling bothered and unsettled. But once those feelings go away, you are still left with plenty of questions. Who turned first? Who sabotaged the blood bank? When did this particular character get turned? What would you do if you could not trust anyone you know to actually be who they say they are? Would you act any differently from the characters in this movie if you were in their shoes? If the thing copies you, how much of you is still left afterwards? To that, I would like to add another question. What happens if we switch the aliens in these two movies? While I love this substitution experiment, there's a problem with it. And it's that it's never going to be the same for any set of two movies. Also, the rules are completely made up. Like, does poor E.T. have to start the movie sprinting while dodging the bullets of some crazy Norwegian? Does the thing start in the forest, or does it escape the authorities and instead start in the Taylor family shed? Depending on the answer you pick, the tone of each movie shifts dramatically. And while these changes may seem quite obvious, there is a point to the exercise. The thing is a monstrous, dangerous alien, and E.T. is a peaceful, kind one. Obviously, each one will contribute to the story differently. But the thing is, if Elliot doesn't find E.T., there's no movie. The entire premise depends on this specific young boy finding this specific alien and helping him find his way home. If E.T. showed up at the Antarctic base, for example, it is quite possible that one of the characters there could have formed a similar bond with the alien, and that makes for an entirely different dynamic and story. The movie could become a drama opposing those who want to return the alien to its people against those who want to use it to earn a Nobel Prize. It could also have been a feel-good comedy about a bunch of cabin-fevered researchers befriending an alien. But what makes the thing fundamentally different from E.T. beyond the obvious is that it dictates the narrative, regardless of who encounters it. And there's only two ways this narrative goes. Either it succeeds, undetected, or someone realizes what is happening. And while personality may play a part in this, as is evidenced by how quickly and efficiently McCready takes control of the situation in the movie, human beings in general will always react the same way when confronted with the horrific idea that people they knew have been replaced by copies. In other words, a movie with the thing is always going to be a horror movie. And it is always going to force us to ask ourselves the same questions, as uncomfortable as they may make us. Turns out John Williams won the Oscar for Best Soundtrack with E.T. It was one of his five wins and over 50 nominations. Ennio Morricone was only ever nominated for six. And he only won one for Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight. It's my favorite movie of his. Not his best, but definitely my favorite. Something about that movie's atmosphere of paranoia and distrust seemed eerily familiar. And when I went to do my research, I found out why. Three of the movie's tracks are unused parts of the soundtrack for The Thing, which were put in due to time constraints. Although I am certain that Tarantino did not mind using them. After all, his movie is directly inspired by The Thing. This is probably the closest that The Thing is ever going to get to an Oscar. But I think that's fine. After all, a movie can get all the accolades in the world and end up just another trophy on the wall. I think what really matters is how much people want to talk about it. 
and I know that just as it did when people started debates and rewinded the tape looking for clues back in the 90s, the thing will continue to live rent-free in people's heads for many years to come, regardless of what shape it takes.